The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Blake Robinson from ICLE Africa, connecting to this international audience of currently over 35 participants from all over the world. Um, contacting you today from Cape Town in South Africa. And as you may know, ICLE is the leading global network of over 1,500 cities, towns, and regions committed to building a sustainable future. This is our first circular economy webinar for African cities and is a collaboration between ICLE, the African Circular Economy Network, and UN Environment. Our agenda for today's webinar is as follows. Um, after a, uh, the first 10 minutes, I will hand over to Alex Lemil from African Circular Economy Network, who will be followed by Cecilia Njenga from UN Environment. Uh, then Shannon Royden Turner will talk about her work with biomimicry at Actuality. Muriel Diaco will talk about her work with Joe Mann. And then we will have Eddie Colisang from Wiego and Cordy Aziz from Environment 360 in Ghana. At the end, we'll have about 20 minutes for questions, and then we will wrap up. And I'll explain briefly how the questions will work. So our circular economy work at ICLE um, is quite a new uh, area of work for ICLE. At our World Congress in 2018, the organization adopted a new strategy known as the Five Pathways to create systemic change through its work with cities in the coming years. One of these pathways is circular development, which looks at new models for production and consumption that build sustainable societies based on recyclable, shareable, and replenishable resources to end the wasteful linear model of produce, consume, and discard. Within this area of work, we look at closing material loops and maximizing the value of resources by applying the circular approach, reduce, rethink, reuse, repair, recycle, and recover, by encouraging equitable access to resources, by supporting new local and productive economies and job creation, working with the business sector from early market engagement to the delivery of circular solutions, and using procurement power to shift away from the linear model. In our various projects around the world, we engage with different aspects of the circular economy. For example, we're working on municipal waste management and how to close material loops in municipal waste management through the Urban Women's Project, which um, looks at eco-innovative strategic plans for waste prevention and management, and that's based mainly in Europe. In South America, we're developing a guidebook for integrated waste management plans in Brazil. In South Asia, we're looking at integrated waste management solutions and assessing urban waste management baselines. In terms of water, energy, food nexus, we're working on the City Food Project, which looks at developing sustainable and resilient city region food strategies. The If When Project, which looks at innovation in the food, energy, water nexus. The, we're also looking at the creation of enabling frameworks for urban nexus initiatives in seven Asian countries. And innovative and sustainable technologies for a resource recovery based treatment of wastewater in three Spanish cities. In terms of um, looking at local productive economies, we are working on circular procurement and developing best practice uh, guidelines for circular procurement so that circular principles can be embedded into public procurement processes. We're also developing the City Business Collaboration Accelerator, which brings government and business together to in the form of workshops um, so they can have early engagements on collaboration barriers, new opportunities and innovative partnership models to promote a circular economy. In terms of our um, work with African cities, um, I'm going to hand over quickly to my, my colleague um, Claudia Schroeder, who's going to explain one of our projects that we recently conducted in Lilongwe, Malawi, which focused on composting. Over to you, Claudia. Claudia, you'll need to unmute yourself.
Yeah, hello. Claudia, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, no, so, I'm not okay, so Sorry. Claudia. Yes. Okay, I think we're having difficulty with the connection there. I'm just going to con continue on with the agenda for today. Um, so please note that the attendees are automatically muted throughout the presentation. Um, and this is just to make the management of the questions and answering sessions a bit easier. So the questions will be posed um, to the speakers at the end of the webinar, and you'll be able to contribute them through the questions text box um, on the side of the screen. You'll see there's a, a gray bar that says questions. Um, please keep questions short and to the point and indicate the person to which you wish to direct them. And please note that the webinar will be recorded so that we can access it in, in future. As a general note about ICLE Africa's work on the circular economy, we're looking to do more circular development work with our African member cities and are putting together a short questionnaire to gain a better understanding of, of where the city's le needs lie. We'll soon be sending this out to the webinar participants and would really appreciate it if you could please spare a few minutes to complete the questionnaire sometime in the next two weeks. And we'll send out further details following the webinar. I think um, because we're having difficulty connecting through to Claudia, I'm going to hand over to Alex for now to talk about his work at ASIN. Over to you, Alex. Thank you, Blake. Uh, maybe we can have Claudia speak after my presentation if we manage to, to get her back on track. So um, just as a brief presentation, uh, I am Alex Lemire, uh, co-founder and general secretary for the African Circular Economy Network. So as a, on behalf of my colleagues, uh, co-founders as well, I will present to you uh, the African Circular Economy Network today and uh, with its details. So basically we, are, we have a vision statement which states that uh, we are looking at building restorative uh, African economies uh, with a focus on generating well-being and prosperity inclusive of its people. So the, the, the form of uh, economic production and consumption based on the circular economy principles and concepts will also have this uh, social inclusiveness approach uh, for the African continent because it makes sense uh, here in, in the continent. And with the objective of regenerating its, uh, its environmental resources. We are a non-for-profit non organization registered in South Africa. Um, ASIN, so the African Circular Economy Network, uh, aims at uh, focusing on who is the best expert in, in the continent uh, to talk about circular economy adapted to the country's market needs, uh, but also uh, share the best practices uh, from Africa to the rest of the world. Uh, we have a network of in-country chapters, and we'll talk about it uh, in a minute. And we also connect with international networks and, uh, and organizations. So what is the, the circular economy all about? Well, the circular economy is uh, aims at the reuse of vast amount of material, which is the foundation of new economic activities. So basically by restorating and, uh, the technosphere, so the economic spheres where we have technical material uh, flowing uh, through the economy, uh, we will generate feedback loops so that we can repair, maintain, remanufacture, redistribute, and also recycle uh, material uh, in vast amounts. We can also uh, regenerate uh, the biosphere by maintaining uh, the biological cycles, so identifying all the, the food element and agricul agricultural and non-agricultural uh, biological elements that we will uh, ensure that it cycles back to the biosphere in a safe mode. So the, the circular economy is about uh, restorative uh, and uh, by design and intention. It's about renew using renewable energy. The main principle of a circular economy is about rebuilding the natural capital and we know how critical it is in the African continent uh, to focus on the rebuilding of the natural capital. Here recycling is not 
the preferred option. It's the last resort because recycling uses a lot of energy and uh, leads to uh, the crushing and the mashup fragments of material. So material is not always uh, enhanced in recycling. So we would prefer maintaining products, repairing products or remanufacturing them. Uh, we are moving here away from chemicals. Uh, the less uh, toxic chemicals uh, in the product, the better uh, we can regenerate the biosphere or, or, or reuse uh, the goods. And waste is obviously here uh, considered as an undervalued resource that we will have to, uh, to, va to valorize. In Africa, each chapter represents one country. So the chapters are teams of experts, be it in product design, waste management, uh, urban experts, electronic waste, bio biomimicry, uh, and, and many more. Uh, obviously, there are many, many skills that are needed in, in, in those chapters, and we, we welcome any, uh, any members that can grow our chapter, uh, chapter teams. Uh, each chapter member signs the charter on ethics, and for the time being, they have two main roles, uh, promote circular economy within their own market and understand what are the market needs uh, within their countries and share best practices from their countries uh, so that we can share the, those best, best business cases uh, within Africa and outside of Africa. These are briefly some of the chapters uh, from, from few members to, uh, to a full team. Um, here, the, 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 the biggest teams are from Nigeria, South Africa, Ghana, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, but uh, growing in, in other countries. So uh, really uh, keen on having uh, even more members uh, joining those, uh, those teams and obviously the missing countries that are not appearing on, on this list. Um, a brief, a brief uh, example of what's happening in, in Africa, a few, uh, few circular economy uh, projects or initiatives. Uh, there are many more, obviously. Uh, why this title, a circular continent? Because Africa um, can not only leapfrog, but has uh, in its DNA uh, and the understanding of how to reuse uh, undervalued resources. It's been, it's been what used to be a survival economy, uh, now moving into a professional economy, but basically the African uh, citizens uh, understand why we, we would need to reuse and value uh, material. Uh, they, they have also, this is also the continent with the lowest ecological footprint we don't talk about footprint in circular economy, but, but here this is critical because the lower the footprint, uh, the easier it is to, to move to a circular uh, model. And lastly, uh, people, communities are highly collaborative. Uh, obviously, there is a bit of, uh, they are losing some, some collaborative aspect and moving to more individualistic uh, behavior, but but the collaborative uh, nature of co African communities is still very strong, and this is what we require in, in a circular economy model. But there is also this Green Great Wall uh, initiatives covering uh, 16 countries, and uh, we have been uh, speaking at the African Development Bank in Abidjan about uh, how to, uh, to initiate circular economy thinking within the Great Wall uh, initiatives. Uh, lastly, uh, ASEN, ASEN, the, the, the objective of ASEN is to collaborate with uh, international uh, organizations like WEF, the EU, and ICLEAR. Uh, we also collaborate with the Governmental uh, Alliance for Circular Economy in Africa, with the governments of Nigeria, Rwanda, and South Africa. We have uh, started an academia support program with few universities, uh, mainly uh, from, from, from South Africa for the time being, but growing. And we collaborate with global networks, be it in, in Europe, Latin America, uh, or even at times uh, Asia. And these are the, the type of cooperation we are open to, to work uh, on with you in research analysis, training, uh, opportunities on training, learning expeditions, uh, networking and events, and knowledge exchange. You are welcome to contact us at uh, info at ASEN.Africa, whether to join our chapters uh, or to collaborate on projects in Africa. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Alex. Um, this is Peter Desmond here. I'm um, with Alex, a co-founder of the African Circular Economy Network, and I'm taking over from um, Blake in respect of uh, connecting the, uh, the speakers together. Um, and just a reminder, if you have a question, please um, put the questions in um, the appropriate uh, question box, and we will come back to them at the end of this session. Um, also to make you aware that this uh, session is being recorded um, and will be available to participants afterwards. And I, I see that um, Claudia is back online. Um, Claudia, are you available to um, to give a few minutes to the project that Blake was uh, um, talking about? Um, yes. Uh, hi there. Sorry, my internet seemed to have given me a little bit of trouble, so I got kicked out. But I am back, and I am still available to give the presentation. Um, let me just set it up. Can everyone, can you see my slides? Yes, I can. Okay, wonderful. Um, okay, so as Blake mentioned, um, my name is Claudia, Claudia Schroeder, and I am working at Icky Africa. And today I will be presenting on, on part of the Una Rivers project. Una Rivers is part of the Urban Natural Assets for Africa program, and the Una Rivers project is currently being implemented in four cities. Um, that includes Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, in Tebe and Kampala in Uganda. Una Rivers has Una Rivers has one primary objective, and the primary objective is integrating nature into local level planning and decision making processes. Um, in addition to Una Rivers, there's also Una Coast, which also falls under the Urban Natural Asset Program. However, Una Coast is focused on Mozambique. And for the specifics of this presentation, I'll be focusing on um, the city of Lelongwe, which is a project city of Una Rivers. In the heart of Lelongwe, which is the capital of Malawi, is the Lelongwe River. This is the main source of water for the city. And how this river, however, this river is being seriously degraded due to deforestation, sand mining, pollution, and land use change. The area in this photo has been earmarked to be a public open park for the citizens of Lelongwe, with the primary aim of restoring the section of the Lelongwe River. However, as with many open spaces in African cities, encroachment has occurred and many of many sections in the open space. This area is known to locals as the Toko and Lizulu Market, two markets that have sprung up on each side of the river. These markets are known to be the highest point source of pollution on the Lelongwe River. And given that these areas are zoned for development of a public park, all authorities had wished to move this market, these markets. However, these markets serve over 4,500 people daily. They are a major source of livelihoods for a huge percentage of Lelongwe's residents and are very important economic and social hubs, which have now actually become embedded in the urban framework of the city. As a result of its importance, and because of the council's plan for the area, this area was chosen for a pilot river restoration project under the Una Rivers program. A master plan was developed through intense stakeholder engagement processes, which you can see in the um, slideshow. Different elements and components were put together. A prioritization exercise occurred where all the different components of the panel were discussed and the ones with the highest urgency were chosen to be implemented first. 
Waste management at the site was nominated as the first priority or component of the plan to be implemented. Activities on the ground related to waste management started in 2017. So the hard activities that have been implemented to date include capacity building, training 10 women in composting, establishing compost sites, which have been further developed to very small waste recycling sites, uh, waste cleanups, um, as well as building a shelter uh, that can be used to lock tools. And then as well, um, there's also been a project of buying various tools needed, such as wheelbarrows and bins. So compost making, was chosen, compost making was chosen as the first activity as it touches uh, on many of the project objectives and primarily 70% of the waste at the site is organic. This provides the perfect opportunity to generate livelihoods whilst also collecting waste and cleaning up the Longwe River. Uh, primarily organic waste is also generated at the site, which is mainly a food market. Women were chosen to be in charge of the composting uh, due to the various cultural and gender aspects of Malawi. Other than these activities, the softer elements implemented, implemented at the site are actually the most important. Uh, through, through providing these basic services, the entire way and process that waste moves at the site has been transformed. The different sections of the market have all given different colored bins and they use their informal governance processes to ensure organic waste is taken to the compost site. So far, 15 tons of compost have been generated and five tons of waste have been collected through a river cleanup exercise. The main generation of money has not been so large, although many women have been able to buy cell phones for, for the work. The composters express the main return on investment is being seen in in that they can sell their tomatoes and produce for more as they have better and healthier produce than, than they did before. The composters are using the compost um, on their own gardens, which then they sell back at the market. If you have any questions or want to get in touch uh, with regards to the Una Rivers pro project, you can just get hold of us via our website or you can follow us on Twitter, particularly the hashtags Una Rivers or Una Coast for any project updates. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Claudia, for that presentation. And um, moving on, um, trying to keep to time as best we can, I'd like to um, welcome Cecilia Nyanga from UN Environment. Um, if she could uh, share her screen now and um, present to us about the work of UN Environment. Okay. Okay. Good morning. My name is Cecilia Jenga. Oh, good afternoon. I am the head of the United Nations Environment Program, uh, based uh, out of South Africa uh, in Pretoria. I will be sharing with you uh, on the concept of the circular economy as we understand it at UNEP and also some of the initiatives uh, we've put in place uh, to support the work of many, many of our member states and other partners uh, on circular economy in Africa. Um, I'll start off by sharing with you our understanding um, of the circular economy and we at UNEP understand it as a systemic perspective uh, which embraces the entire value chain uh, in an effort to mitigate loss of materials both in terms of their function and in terms of their value um, and also a shift away from our commonly uh, known approaches of take, make and dispose uh, and where we work to retain the highest possible value of material by, by maximizing collection and capture and also ensuring that materials are retained along the entire life cycle. Uh, we also do understand that circular economy is multi-layered in terms of its dimension. And here I will try and discuss and share with you examples of how we we have focused particularly at the local government level and at the city level where we see the long-term effects of transformation where cities and local governments embrace circular economy approach. 
Uh, we know that uh, in Africa, uh, it's one of the continents that's growing in an unprecedented speed. Uh, we are told that 56% of the population by 2050 will be urbanized, but more so the characteristics of this urbanization process is that we'll see majority of the people living mainly in medium-sized and smaller cities, you know, with less than a million inhabitants, and majority again of these people living in low income of what or what we refer mostly as informal settlements with limited access to basic services and infrastructure, and therefore the need for local governments and cities to embrace a circular economy approach if we will be able to lead, you know to we will be able to uh, uh, meet the requirements particularly for basic services and infrastructure of the people living in informal settlements uh, we see the circular economy uh, as one that will be able to promote and adopt um, low uh, carbon uh, and low greenhouse gas emissions uh, reduce the loss of the, how we use re resources and also ease our burden in terms of ensuring cities are able to move uh, in terms of mobility better, provide, uh, provi or provide food in a much more equitable way and also live in much more balanced uh, ecosystem. Um, I will share with you briefly some of the initiatives that UN Environment has undertaken uh, in terms of uh, moving further uh, this agenda. Uh, the Global Initiative for Resource Efficient Cities, popularly known as GIREC, is a platform of collaboration to implement urban metabolism at the city level. Uh, GREC promotes uh, systematic approaches or systemic approaches uh, such as urban metabolism or urban morphology towards building low carbon, resilient, um, and resource efficient cities. A number of tools, methods have been developed by GREC, which have been applied to cities across the world in terms of strengthening their capacity to become uh, more resilient and more resource efficient. Uh, PACE, which is a partnership for accelerating the circular economy, is another initiative, particularly at the global level. Uh, and this initiative is mainly focusing around plastics and marine litter, as well as electronics and electronic waste. In Africa, PACE is currently working in Nigeria, where we are supporting uh, uh, the development of a national program on e-waste um, across the country, uh, but also so focusing on how uh, uh, local governments can better manage e-waste within their environments. Uh, we are also in the process of carrying out initial uh, baseline research here in South Africa uh, along the, uh, the e-waste uh, uh, you know, stream of, of, of waste. The third uh, initiative is a Switch Africa Green, again working with small and medium industries and basically integrating their role in the value chains uh, Across agriculture, we have identified four sectors. Agriculture being a key sector for Africa, uh, we still know that 60 to 70 percent uh, of people across Africa rely on agriculture as the main economic uh, sector, providing jobs, uh, employment, and income for the people. So SMMEs are integrated in agriculture. We are also looking at the issues of energy, uh, particularly particularly cleaner energy and the role that SMMEs can play along, along those value chains. Tourism as another economic um, uh, productive sector for Africa, uh, as well as in the manufacturing sector. And in the manufacturing sector, I would just like to highlight the work that the Africa National Cleaner Production Centers across Africa are undertaking along the lines of industrial symbiosis. And it's basically seen within industrial parks how what can be considered as waste of one industry becomes material input for another industry and ensuring as little waste possible along those industrial value chains. Uh, just like to highlight that uh, some of the number of tools that have been developed are uh, and uh, applied uh, under the GREC, the GIREC, the Global Initiative for Resource Efficient Cities, basically to support the transition to low carbon resilient and resource efficient development through circular economy. This include uh, resource flow analysis uh, in terms of understanding better the urban metabolic uh, processes visualization as a tool uh, 
capacity building at local level, uh, including, you know, this kind of webinars have been held globally in su to support the capacity building uh, and capacities of people in cities to understand better urban metabolism, spatial micro simulation, including urban uh, metabolism tools, which have been developed mainly to support the downscaling of national level data for use at local level uh, in terms of ensuring that decisions are made through an evidence-based uh, process, and including putting in place spatial elements, including scenario planning uh, and building capacity for people to be able to use data to calculate and ensure equitable distribution of resources and how these resources flow uh, through a circular economy transitions. These are just some of the tools uh, that have been developed through the Global Initiative for Resource Efficient Cities. Uh, that map just illustrates some of the pilot projects where they are located. And as you can see, they're across the world in Latin America, in Brazil, Colombia, Peru, Philippines, uh, China, Brussels, and Cape Town. And I will go a little bit deeper on the Cape Town approach uh, you know, in my next slide. Uh, in Cape Town last year, in 2018, we were able to do a much more in-depth study to understand the urban metabolism in Cape Town. As you know, uh, we did have a water crisis uh, in Cape Town and offered us an opportunity to try and see how urban metabolism or a circular economy a systemic approach can be useful in terms of informing policy making and how we manage our resources in a more efficient manner. We found that cities uh, rely very much, the city of Cape Town relies on fossil fuels, significant uh, regional role in terms of food processing, and it also has a significant role in terms of local extractive processes. It's a coastal city, therefore uh, fisheries are extracted heavily, agriculture and mining are key elements in terms of that extractive process. We also saw that the impact of the city's infrastructure uh, and its resource profiling are quite critical in understanding better the urban metabolism. Uh, in terms of, our, of the study, uh, the, we realized and we focused more on looking at the water prices and the water issue. The water uh, metabolism has dramatically changed over the years. And you can see from 2011 to 2015, uh, the water security aspects have really changed uh, and the informal settlements are very much uh, grown and very much therefore impacted by some of the crisis in the water security situation. And therefore some of the social interventions uh, that we realized were very important is issues related to be behavioral change and developing behavioral nudging messages, uh, widespread messaging across uh, the city, are looking at financial incentives as a way to address that, and of course, institutional negotiation, including, I will add here, rural, urban, uh, you know, linkages and interfaces in terms of ensuring that the institutional aspects and the governance aspects are addressed uh, within that framework. In conclusion to the study, uh, what we found is that the city needs to invest more in frequent uh, detailed efforts to collect reliable data on resource flows. But there is need for us and for experts to analyze this data for purposes of evidence-based decision-making. And thirdly, the need for awareness raising campaigns and training of consumers. In conclusion, I would like to say that uh, for, I think for cities and the local governments, particularly in low income settlements, where there is a huge deficit in terms of uh, infrastructure and basic service delivery, innovation is central if we are to achieve our circular economy. What we realize, and you know, really giving credit to the presentation that was made earlier by the African Circular Economy Network that showed quite a number of initiatives across Africa, we do know that still only a very small fraction of the economies, cities or local government, and particularly in low-income uh, neighborhoods, have embraced circularity and have started the transition of a sustainable consumption and production system, particularly in a systemic city-wide process. So this is something I hope that through this uh, webinar, we will be able to discuss and come up with, with practical solutions and suggestions of how we can expand uh, our knowledge as well as expand our actions and innovations to address the circular economy in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Cecilia, for your presentation.
Um, I'd like now to introduce, or just to remind attendees that uh, we have a question panel. Um, if you'd like to ask a question of any of the presenters, please uh, add that to the, to the question box. And um, I'd like now to invite um, Shannon Royden Turner from Actuality to share her screen and to present to us about their work on biomimicry. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I think I'm going to select to do a webcam um, in place of a presentation, <laughs> um, just so that you don't have to keep looking at um, pages of, of text. Uh, I thought that would make a, a nice difference for you. Uh, so I run a, a consultancy in Cape Town, um, and it's called Actuality. And it's really focusing on how do we accelerate change. So I've been working in all aspects of, um, of city making over the last uh, sort of 20 years, trying to figure out, uh, you know, what are the leverages for, for, for change? And in terms of the circular economy, I think I really first started looking at it in, in 2000 when I did my architecture thesis. And I looked at the a kind of a large building scale and how do we close all the loops within the building and make it completely self-sustaining. Um, and that was at the, the building scale. And obviously since then I've kind of grown looking um, at, at larger and larger and larger scales of, of the city. But it's really just one component of my work. Um, and it, it, the work that I do broadly ranges from, you know, how do we look at human behavior? How do we incorporate multi-stakeholder processes? How do we develop business cases for integrated urban solutions? Um, you know, what, what kind of infrastructure is needed for um, accelerating businesses within the circular economy or scaling innovation to um, a large scale? So it sort of varies. But the one question that I'm continually trying to explore is, with all the solutions already out there, which I really believe that they, we have all the solutions that we need already, but yet we seem to continue to do more and more of the same. And so I've been trying to explore what are the leverages that we can use to actually accelerate change towards things like um, the circular economy. So I'm just gonna run through um, some of my experiences um, and some of the conclusions that I've come to in working over the last um, probably 10 years more intensely in trying to actually implement the circular economy uh, predominantly in Africa. And um, when I did my uh, master's in urban infrastructure in 2010, I looked at um, a material flow analysis in an informal settlement. And really my question that I was trying to grapple with is, in areas where people are not um, paying for services, so there's no rate space, is there a different way of being able to deliver infrastructure that can create economic opportunities and through that enable the ability for these areas to get a high level of service um, that could you know, pay for itself as well as start to create businesses. And so what I did was map um, an informal settlement to look at how do materials flow through this, through this area? How are people using materials? Where are the closed loops already? And how do we then use that as a way of upgrading these areas? Um, and one of the interesting things that I discovered was obviously that informal settlements are a massive um, environmental sink in essence for all uh, building materials and um, electronic goods. You know, and um, you know, kitchen and kitchenware and stuff like that. And uh, because a lot of the the building material that is used to build informal settlements is um, from demolitions, and so I started to question: Well, that's a massive closed loop that already exists in the city. How can we intervene in that system to improve the quality of building that's happening? Um, and so. So a question that I was left with out of that process was, what would, a, what would a system look like if you were able to, at the city scale, improve 
the quality of material that people build informal settlements with by introducing a like an upcycling phase from demolitions to reuse. Um, and would that be a way of creating new economic opportunities in, in these areas? And through that, improving the quality of houses that people build with. Um, and then pretty much, and that was the, the main kind of uh, closed loop cycle that I found um, as existing. And then the other interesting one was um, how people use water in informal settlements. Obviously, when the water is running at the tap, it's not very valuable. But once someone's got it into their house and they've carried it to their house, that water becomes very valuable and people use it over and over and over. So there are, um, there's already significant recycling and reuse happening within the house in terms of water. But the result of that is that it's very polluted when it gets thrown away and this gets thrown away outside our houses. And the impacts of that are huge in terms of a whole system of, of health. Um, and then I had the opportunity to work on a project um, in an informal settlement to look at how do we address the wastewater, stormwater and solid waste kind of nexus in informal settlements. So it was related to a bigger economic question um, in the Western Cape, which was the pollution of the Berg River. And the Berg River is used as one of the primary um, irrigation um, resources for the fruit that gets exported. And that was under threat from the um, European Union. So the government needed to look at how do we clean the Berg River. Um, and one of the task areas was informal settlements. So we looked at how do we pilot and apply uh, biomimicry to developing innovative solutions in this context. And one of the um, technologies that we looked at working with was um, someone called an engineer from the States called uh, John Todd. And he's developed these incredible um, ecological machines, which is basically a wastewater treatment works. Um, the reason that I was interested in working with these systems is because in place of um, throwing chemicals into cleaning water, he's created a system where there are these tanks that have um, a full complex ecosystem inside them. And that is used for purifying the water because obviously in nature, there is no such thing as waste. Everything is just food for some other organism. So we needed to figure out what was in the water and then combine it with the organism that wants to eat whatever's in the water and then you end up with clean water. But for me, what was interesting about this approach is that instead of the cost um, of chemicals and chemical engineers to manage a system, you now have a system that is creating plants, fish, bacteria, algae. And in one of the projects that they had done, they had a, a polishing system at the end of the, the wastewater treatment works, and it was filled with koi fish. And there was, a, um, there was at least a million rands worth of koi fish in that pond. And so I was, that's an amazing opportunity. You know, it's not just, it's not small value stuff. That's actually quite a lot of value. Um, and what does that look like in the context of an informal settlement? Um, and can we create businesses out of that? And then the other component of it was looking at the solid waste. Um, and again, it was looking at not how do we recycle, but how do we upcycle? How do we really create a lot of value in these systems? And one of the projects that we looked at um, was done in the UK where they converted cardboard to caviar. So they took cardboard from restaurants um, put it into horse stables where it got mulched up and combined with the horse manure. And then they fed that to worms. Um, and then they could feed the worms to sturgeon fish, collected the caviar and sold it back to the restaurants. And so, you know, that was a complete mind shift in terms of, wow, there's a lot of value in that potential. And what does that look like in informal settlements? So that was the task that we set out with um, in Langrich, which is in Franschhoek, uh, just outside Cape Town. And um, the system has been implemented, but nowhere near to the degree of, 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 of what I'd envisioned um, at the, at the on, on, onset of the project in terms of really realizing the economic um, gains because it was always a water project, a solid waste um, kind of uh, wasn't fully funded, so we didn't get to realize 
the idea of, um, of really upcycling at that scale. Uh, but the questions and the, the process still remain. And I think some of the interesting things that we learned from that process was, you know, that when you're trying to initiate um, the circular economy, it does require not only collaborative design and collaborative decision making, but you really need to integrate in processes of leadership and organizational development because in order to implement and realize change at that level, you need different kinds of leaders and you need different kinds of organizations because the management of the system is so completely different and suddenly you've got infrastructure that's delivering um, you know, business opportunities and how do you manage that? How do you transition from traditional infrastructure delivery to delivering businesses and then who gets those businesses and how do you, how do you deal with that? So there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of questions that arise through the process of, of delivering a project like this. Um, and obviously funding was, um, was a critical thing. It was funded by government and so it had a whole lot of constraints that typically come with government um, funding and processes and tendering um, that made it really difficult to actually realize the, the kind of bigger vision of, of what we were trying to achieve. Uh, but lots of learning and I think lots of opportunities still to expand and still realize. Um, and I think you also have to realize that you've got to build, build the pieces slowly. You know, you, there's kind of an end vision of where you're trying to get to, but there's a lot of building blocks that need to be built on the journey towards um, realizing the, the, the full potential of, of the vision. Um, Shannon, I'm afraid um, we're going to have to call a halt there. And if you wouldn't mind cool. uh, turning your webcam off. Um, cool. We have. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much for your presentation. And um, I, there are a couple of people who've got their hands up. And uh, I'm afraid that we won't have time for questions by voice. Could um, would it be possible to uh, add your question to the uh, to the question box? Thank you very much. Um, actually, Ellie, I think we've got Muriel on next. Um, so um, would you mind turning off your webcam just for a moment? That would be great. Um, and um, so I'd like to introduce Muriel uh, Diaco from Juman and. Um, if you would like to share your screen, Muriel, and uh, present to us the work that you're doing in Africa on the circular economy. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. So I am uh, Muriel Diaco, and uh, I am the founder of platform uh, Juman. So uh, Juman is about um, catalyzing sustainable development in Africa. And uh, we've been working actually around uh, three main pillars, innovation, collaboration, and entrepreneurship. So basically, uh, we are working since our uh, creation, we are working more with uh, Western and Central, uh, Central uh, Africa, uh, so mostly Francophone countries. And uh, what we, we, we do, uh, is that we we working with uh, young entrepreneurs, with startups, and with SMEs, and um, we help them to uh, uh, to structure the the projects and the activities, and uh, they, we we are as well providing them with resources that are critical um, for them uh, to uh, to grow, and we as well connect them with business partners, and the common point. Um, uh, with all the projects that we are supporting is that they have a, a strong link with uh, impact uh, creation, impact generation, and sustainable development. And uh, we've been doing that uh, for three years now. And more recently, we uh, have started uh, initiating projects with partners, uh, always in link, in link with um, impact creation, and this is how uh, we are getting invo involved in uh, circular economy initiatives. So uh, today I am going to tell you about an example uh, made in Cameroon. Uh, it is a startup uh, with whom we've been working um, since uh, we, we started. The name uh, is Kemit Ecology. So why have I decided to tell you about this particular example? Because I think it's it really reflects um, how circular economy can 
uh, bring value um, to African cities. When I, when I say value, it's not only financial value, but it, it is as well uh, social and environmental value. So uh, Kemit Ecology is based in Cameroon. And basically, uh, they, they are producing um, um, green charcoal briquettes. So it is, it is um, uh, quite uh, interesting because they're actually collecting um, their, their, um, their raw material, so the waste from um, markets and as well households. So they take um, banana, plantain peels, cassava, peels as well, corn, and um, they transform it, they process it and transform it, it into uh, a clean energy um, source. Uh, so what they, they, they are bringing actually is, is um, a, a way of cleaning up the um, urban environment because today uh, they go uh, in the market and they're just um, taking the kind of uh, piles of dumps that they, they find. Um, so they, they're making the, the environment as well safer and less prone to um, bacteria and germs that can cause um, disease. And um, they, so they, they produce the ecological uh, charcoal, uh, knowing that um, today 80% uh, of the population, I think in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, is using wood or, uh, or charcoal for cooking. And um, this, this has, has very big, um, big consequences, both for the environment and on people's health. So uh, I find a figure, uh, which is that 600,000 people uh, die each year because of the pollution due to the use of uh, wood or, 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 or charcoal to cook. So this is just um, death that can be avoided. On top of that, to produce um, firewood, uh, you need to cut trees. So it means deforestation and uh, climate change. And also the, the traditional kind of um, wood and charcoal are really um, polluting because it emits smoke and this smoke is actually harmful for uh, the people who are using, um, using it to, to cook. So the solution of chemist ecology is really um, to provide you know, a, a kind of um, yes, clean energy and as well um, a, a better way to um, yeah to 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 find um, uh, energy source to to cook. So um, their 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 charcoal is called green charcoal. Um, first, because it is produced from um, organic waste, and then because uh, it doesn't emit uh, it emits hardly um, no smoke. So it's not harmful to uh, people's health. And it is as well uh, affordable uh, compared to traditional uh, sharp charcoal. It is actually cheaper. So it is um, a kind of very um, comprehensive and, and um, yeah, very sustainable type of uh, solution for cooking. Um, so um, if you look, if we look at this example, it is, um, we can actually learn a lot of uh, lessons. Um, we see that the, the, the opportunities are there because um, um, the, the business model of um, this uh, char green charcoal production has been, has been validated. They've been working for now more than six years, six years. Um, and, and we see all the, the benefits that it can provide from an environmental point of view and as well um, for, from a more social point of view. Um, but if we look at um, the kind of um, hurdles that uh, this initiative uh, is facing and, and uh, as well think about how we can make uh, the initiative more efficient and as well create more value and really um, um, be more circular. Um, so the first, the 
first component uh, to look at is really people people uh, mindset. So today uh, the 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 startup is collecting directly from the market. Uh, if people were um, were doing the the sorting themselves, they they could actually uh, make um, a more efficient and a more effective um, uh, work on the side as well. Um, so um, it is very important to be able to engage uh, people and as well to uh, change their mind about um, what they considered as being a, a, a waste. Uh, today in, um, in, in this part of Africa, and I think uh, it's probably the, the same kind of figure for the, for the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa, 70% of the house, household waste is made of organic waste. So it means that it is potentially um, um, possible to recover this um, waste and to transform it into um, a clean energy source or uh, why not into as well um, composting. And um, uh, yes, um, so the, 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 the first point is really um, how we can improve the collection and the, the sorting really at the source. The second point is about authorities and as well how we can engage them in, um, in, in making more um, circularity. So today, uh, chemical ecology it has links with the authorities, but it remains um, quite superficial. Um, and uh, we, we see that there's uh, po po the possibility of um, implying more the authorities in the sense that the authorities have uh, the ability to, um, to do more sensitization, uh, to, to bring the people to realize and to act differently towards their, their, um, their, their waste. And uh, as well, um, the authorities have this ability uh, to make this in initiative um, more scalable and as well um, um, this initiative can be replicated in other neighborhoods and as well uh, in other cities. So um, it is very important to, to have um, the, the stakeholders um, working together when it, it comes to um, circular um, economy and circular initiatives. And the third, um, the third point is about uh, the initiative itself. Uh, it has been very complicated, um, for example, for, for this startup to get access to financing because, um, because the, the startup was not, um, <laughs> uh, let's say it is not a, a kind of common startup, the, the, the kind of taking very uh, digital uh, where investors um, uh, want to invest in. So it's been, um, a struggle for them to, to find the financing because it's uh, innovative and it, it is a kind of new as well um, type of business. And it has been as well so very complicated for them to, um, to find and, and to, 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 to buy the equipment and the tools uh, for the processing and the, the production. And uh, so I think there, there is uh, a, long, a long way to go. I don't know if the, the way will be long or not, but there is a way to go to as well um, find and, and put in place the, the right type of financing for those kind of initiatives. Um, because they, they, are, they are kind of small, they cannot um, go and, and see very large um, donors or, or investors. So we need as well to think of um, appropriate type of financing and appropriate type of partnership um, to, to, to get those kind of initiative um, grow and um, create more value. I'm afraid um, and, Nuria, uh, I'm going to have to interrupt you. Um, I hope that's all right in terms of finishing off your yes. presentation. That you, I hope you've finished your presentation. Um, yes, uh, I have finished. Oh, okay. Thank Sorry you, to sir. interrupt you, Nuria. Um, no worries, if I can just say uh, uh, the last word. Okay. <laughs> so 
yes, this, this was a, a, an example of the, the work that we are doing. If you want to know more about uh, circular initiatives that we, we support, uh, you can go on our blog or you can uh, contact me directly um, after the, the webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Muriel. And I see that Ellie has already um, shared his webcam. So um, I'd like to introduce Ellie Kodisang from Wiego. If you'd like to um, share with us your work on the circular economy um, in Africa, Ellie. Um, would you like to unmute your microphone, Ellie? Okay, go ahead. Please unmute your microphone again. Okay, there, okay, I think it's working good. now. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Eddie Godisan, um, and I'm an organizer uh, based in Johannesburg, South Africa, uh, for WIGO, um, which is um, an organization, an international NGO that works with uh, informal workers. Um, WIGO has um, started a project uh, two years ago um, called Waste Pickers Integration South Africa, um, which is uh, aimed at uh, ensuring um, that uh, there is the a beginning of an integration process uh, of in integrating retainers um, in, in South Africa. Um, just to say something about the words that I will be using, um, the group that we are working with uh, prefer to be called reclaimers as opposed to, to, to waste speakers. So um, if I say reclaimers, um, I mean what uh, people that are popularly known as, as, as waste speakers. And the reason for that is that people feel that they don't deal with waste, they actually deal with, uh, with value, materials of value, and their role is to basically um, reclaim that which has been discarded by society. Um, uh, we started uh, this process um, two years ago um, of uh, basically um, engaging um, in particular with the city of, of Johannesburg to ensure that there is uh, integration of, uh, of reclaimers. And the project uh, quickly, um, in a sense, uh, moved away from what we uh, was initially envisaged to more of a much more grounded and deeper process of uh, organizing um, 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 reclaimers around the city, um, not just in Johannesburg, but in a city called uh, Sasolbeck and also in uh, Pretoria, which is the capital city of, of, of Johannesburg. Um, just to um, say a little bit of a background on, on the state of uh, play in South Africa um, as far as integration is concerned. Um, first of all, um, we no one has precise numbers of uh, people that work as waste pickers or reclaimers in South Africa. The CSIR, um, which is a leading uh, research, uh, state-owned uh, research uh, agency, estimates that there are about uh, 62,147 um, um, reclaimers in South Africa, um, but estimates go up to 100,000. And we estimate that in Johannesburg, um, about between 10 and 15,000 of, of, of those people uh, are active uh, in South Africa. And of those uh, 62,147 that the CSIR has spoken about, about 25,000 of them um, uh, operate as uh, trolley pushers. You know, they work in the, in the streets and they walk around uh, on a daily basis collecting sorting, processing, and transporting material for sale. While uh, about uh, 36,000 people operate in landfills, and basically their job is to wait for um, um, municipal uh, waste trucks uh, to, to arrive, and they sort through materials, and they take that which is of value. And, um, and um, we 
because of the activities of that particular sector of, of workers and the fact that the state has started gathering statistics, I think in Johannesburg, we have a more or less an accurate sense of the kind of tonnages of, of material that is recovered, um, which runs in the, in the hundreds of tons uh, in each of the municipal uh, waste, waste sites. Um, the South Africa has a national uh, waste management strategy that was uh, adopted in 2011, which recognizes uh, the need to grow uh, clean jobs um, emanating from, from the, the waste value chain. And uh, the Act basically allocates uh, responsibility for the development of guidelines uh, on, on integration of reclaimers by the Department of Environmental Affairs. And it is um, a very unique process that has been embarked upon by the state uh, to draft guidelines for municipalities for, for the integration of, of reclaimers. And um, there is a process that will lead to the publishing of these guidelines, I think, in the next uh, couple of months. And um, the city of uh, Johannesburg is part of this uh, uh, national process. Um, uh, so is the group of uh, reclaimers that WIGO has uh, been working with, who have recently launched an organization called the mm -hmm. African Reclaimers Organization. Um, however, for us, the process of uh, integration and uh, attempts at integration with the city of Johannesburg has not always been a, a very successful one. But uh, if I can just throw one more statistic uh, to you, um, is that um, um, According to the CSRR, um, South Africa uh, processes over 50.5% of uh, post-consumer packaging uh, materials compared, I think, to um, uh, uh, countries in the EU with process about, I think, uh, just over uh, 30. And 90% um, of this uh, material that is uh, collected uh, for recycling and for reuse is actually collected by the by the informal sector. So the informal sector collects, separates, and transports materials to point of sale. And these services are usually uh, uh, brought to the state and to, to 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 industry. So in a way, one can say that the informal sector actually subsidizes uh, both government and industry in ensuring that there is uh, removal of uh, materials and that the material is is available for for either reprocessing or, or repurposing. Um, so one of the ways um, in which the city has uh, dealt with uh, integration of, of reclaimers has been to, to, to subcontract um, um, the collection of, 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 of recyclables to, to private companies. And um, this um, has been done mostly uh, in the wealthiest uh, parts of the city, that is the, um, those parts of the city um, that have the most materials um, that are collected by reclaimers. Um, and, and, and this process of uh, what is what the city calls integration, which is really integration by exclusion, um, has actually had a very devastating effect on the, on the informal sector. And our survey um, where the city had managed to succeed in implementing um, these uh, so-called integration plans has been that uh, people have lost uh, up to 60% of, of their income due to this. And what basically happens is that the city um, uh, gives out a contract and uh, pays uh, what we suspect to be millions of rents um, to these companies. And um, as a result of these initiatives, um, which um, actually allowed us to, to, to organize people uh, for the first time in history in, in South Africa, um, to organize both people that are working in the landfill and that are working in the streets, um, we actually embarked on a protest march on the 13th of July uh, in 2017, which subsequently led to an agreement with the uh, with a state-owned um, uh, entity that is responsible for waste management, which is Pick It Up, um, hosting a workshop and us having an agreement to basically come up with a framework agreement for integration. Now that framework agreement um, um, has been sitting with the, with the city now since 2017, and we are now in 2019, and we don't actually have it 
as yet um, an agreement on, on integration. However, there has been one aspect, important aspect of this agreement that has been implemented, which I think um, uh, will serve as, a, as an interesting um, 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 example of how things could be done. And this is um, related to the registration of, of reclaimers. Um, we started uh, about a week ago um, to basically register all of the people that are doing this work. And the registration process will have a number of benefits for both us um, as reclaimers and also with the city. The first one is to know precisely the number of people that are doing this work. Secondly, to know the kind of materials that they are collecting and uh, the kind of uh, geographic spread um, and the routes, uh, kinds of routes that they are using uh, to collect the material. Um, and um, what has uh, um, happened uh, so far um, is that um, the, the, we have managed um, to register over a thousand uh, people and there's registration, a registration process that is ongoing as we, as we speak. Now, um, I just wanted to say something um, about, before I go on to talk about um, um, how reclaimers have approached the issue of, of integration. Um, I just wanted to say something about the the social composition of, um, of reclaimers in, in Johannesburg. Um, what's happened is that the, the process of uh, deindustrialization in South Africa that has been ongoing since the 1990s, particularly the collapse of the manufacturing sector and, uh, and the collapse of the mining sector has resulted in, uh, in uh, and those industries, if I may say, have been industries that have absorbed a lot of uh, uh, labor in particular from countries in Southern Africa, countries such as Lesotho, Malawi, uh, uh, Zambia, uh, et cetera, Mozambique. Um, and with the collapse of these industries, uh, we have seen an influx of, uh, of people, uh, whether documented or undocumented, into the streets of Johannesburg to basically work as, as informal recyclers. And um, this has actually meant that our organizing process has had to take into account um, the fact that we have a lot of uh, undocumented uh, workers who are actually doing recycling. And part of the key um, achievements, I think, um, that we've managed, uh, breakthroughs we've managed to, to reach um, has been the fact that um, um, registration of reclaimers is across the board, regardless of uh, people's immigration status. The only requirement is a, a positive proof of, uh, of, of, of identification, which has meant for us that uh, um, it uh, actually allows for, for um, I think, impo important, most importantly, for, for, for the recognition and the formalization of, of, uh, of, of the work um, of all the reclaimers, regardless of their immigration status. I, I'm sorry, but, um, Ellie, we've run out of time for your presentation. Well, I'm, I'm terribly yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but uh, I'm very conscious we need to get to the uh, question and answer session. And we have one last presentation from uh, Cordy Aziz. Would you mind um, uh, stop sharing your, your webcam, okay. Ellie? Yes. So I do apologize for interrupting you there. Um, Cordy, um, could I introduce you and ask you to share your screen. A Cordy is from um, Environment 360, and um, I would like to give you 10 minutes, but we, we are running out rapidly for question and answers now, um, although we are replying to them privately. Um, and perhaps I can encourage the, uh, the panelists to have a look at the questions and see which ones they can reply to, to privately. Um, so um, Cordy, over to you. So thank you very much. Uh, just to provide a little bit of context, uh, I founded uh, Environment 360 about five years ago. Uh, in Ghana, we have almost 29 million people. Uh, we produce about 1.7 billion tons of trash annually, and about 238 million tons of that is actually plastic. Uh, currently, we have a recycling rate of about 2%. Uh, the reason this is of a main issue to Ghana is because we are a coastal country. Uh, so we know we are conscious of the fact uh, that it does have an impact on marine life uh, in our oceans as well. Uh, 
Uh, Environment 360 actually started working in the informal sector in 2015. Uh, and what essentially we used to do is have uh, small waste pickers that we essentially worked with in an area called Jamestown. Uh, then we progressed into a project called Picket, uh, which is essentially a waste picker uh, led sorting center based in Tim and Nude's town. Uh, in 2018 and then here in 2019, we're actually working with GIZ to actually launch a formal uh, take back, which is an incentive based program uh, for plastic bottles or for PET bottles. The reason this work uh, is really essential because here in Ghana, we have, uh, of course, a very linear waste management system. So the average municipality spends about $320,000 a month. Uh, despite that cost, we still have less than 50% of our waste collected each day. Uh, one of the major challenges is that 40% of houses pay for waste disposal, leaving 60% that don't. The 60% that don't pay for waste services are typically in your urban and coastal communities and are made up of informal settlements. So what happens is that even the waste that is picked up, 100% of it goes to landfill. For the 60% that is not picked up, it is indiscriminately dumped. Uh, it is burned or it is dumped near the, the, the ocean front. So what we've been doing is really working with a model that really allows informal sector waste workers to come in and better support the municipal assembly, as well as provide waste management services to the urban and coastal areas so that we can have a visible uh, environmental impact while also having an economic impact. Ideally, the, what we're prototyping is where the municipal assembly uh, works not only with private contractors, as it's done in the past, but it also works with informal sector workers. Since private contractors have a tendency to focus more on your middle and upper income homes, we think that they can continue servicing them and continue receiving their revenue for them, whereas our informal sector waste workers work more in the areas that cannot afford waste collection. We actually work with a variety variety of private companies, uh, such as the, <clears throat> excuse me, such as the Ghana Recycling Incentive by private enterprises. Uh, we work with plastic recyclers. Uh, we work with anybody that's willing to give incentives, not only to uh, our informal sector uh, waste workers, but also homes. This creates sort of a value for the waste. One of the main challenges is that, of course, uh, in this particular part of the world, waste is really not looked at as a valuable commodity. So as a result, we know that we have to introduce some sort of incentive to sort of valorize the waste. What happens in this particular model that we're prototyping is that waste management companies are then able to continue taking their waste to the landfill, minus the recyclables that have been picked up. Uh, and then informal sector waste workers, they actually take their, uh, their waste to a sorting center. One thing um, that I should really point out about this model is that if you look at it, we really encourage private sector workers or private waste management companies to also work with informal sector workers. Um, even though most of our private waste sector workers do, or, or waste uh, management companies, even though they do service middle and upper income houses, when it comes to waste segregation, they're often challenged just due to the needed infrastructure to really carry out waste segregation. Uh, since our waste management system is not subsidized by the government, you'll find that cost is typically uh, the number one reason why they don't do waste segregation. So we also think that there's a critical link between uh, the private sector working with the informal sector as well. So now once the waste actually goes to a sorting center, then it's actually sold off to a recycler. Uh, at this particular point, since we're just building the, the system, Environment 360 really supports the informal sector workers in doing this particular piece. So you'll find that one of the things we work with our informal sector workers with is ensuring that they have good ethics when dealing with buyers, that they understand the quality of materials, that they can recognize the different quality of materials, and they understand what is exactly expected of them. This way, when we are building an industry, it's actually something that can work as a standard 
across all of the informal sector groups that we work with. This then will be able to give our local recycling industry and even some of our international clients a better variety of plastics, which makes it a little bit more reliable uh, and contracts and other things more feasible. So now when we look at sort of our early impact, um, we've been able to do capacity building for nearly 500 informal sector workers. Uh, we provided health insurance for 329. We have had a slight increase in daily wages. Uh, at this point, it's about 15%. Uh, it's still a little bit early for us to tell what the real impact is since we probably are about four months out from being a year. Uh, but we have seen a lot of promise in this. Uh, there's also been improved working conditions. Uh, through our program, one of the things we do is help waste pickers uh, set up uh, a collection method with residential collection uh, or a residential collection system. So through this, what they are able to do is actually collect quality material um, in an organized way. So it stops them from having to dig in garbage cans uh, or dig in gutters to get this. We've also provided protective gear uh, for all of the informal sector workers that we're working with uh, in order to better support them in their work. Uh, they also have been able to improve their, their supply chain. One of the things I think about us having several different projects across different waste pickers is that they really sort of see the impact uh, of working together and the ability for them to aggregate large amounts of waste uh, in short periods of time. Because of this, Environment 360 has really been able to work with local recyclers to really be able to pick up more of this type of material so that we actually have a budding uh, infrastructure here in Ghana. And so far, they've been able to collect about 50 tons of material. Um, since the GIZ, our Kumasi project has been going on for about three months. Uh, the GIZ Accra project is just getting ready to start. Uh, however, between uh, our other activities, between Pickett, uh, between GIZ, Kumasi, and Accra, we're actually projecting uh, to collect 228 tons in total for this particular year. Uh, so, of course, there's always a few keys to success um, that we've learned work really well across all of our projects. Uh, I think number one, co-design uh, is critical. Uh, one thing Environment 360 uh, tries to avoid is really creating programs or testing out our own hypotheses. Uh, we believe that in order to create a working system, we must uh, work on and build on the knowledge that's already there from existing systems. So you will find that we don't look at our informal sector workers um, as sort of individuals that we employ. We really look at them more as partners that have equal say in how the program should run, what it should look like, and what should even be some of the goals uh, and objectives meant for that particular project. Co-design not only goes for the informal sector workers, but it also goes for local uh, authorities as well. Uh, we have had a lot of luck working with local authorities, but we think it's because we include them in uh, at the very beginning versus sort of running the project and then making a set of recommendations to them. So because we are all working together from the very beginning, it really provides uh, a safe area where people have trust uh, and where we start to look at each other as critical partners to achieve our goals. Uh, another thing that we've learned over time is that you must distinguish entrepreneurs from workers. I think there's often a false assumption that just because everybody is in the informal sector uh, working and they have a successful business or they are a sort of an entrepreneur independently, that some of these individuals really want to be entrepreneurs. Uh, through our projects, what we found is that there are two distinct types of waste pickers. You have those that are really entrepreneurial that really, if given an opportunity, will expand their business and take it to the next level. And then you have those where if you offer them a nine to five in the sorting center, they'd much rather do the nine to five uh, in a sorting center. So through this, we've been able to develop a variety of tools and techniques to really distinguish who should sort of be the leaders of the cooperatives that we are building uh, and who should really sort of take lead of a team so that we can continue to increase collection and make it more sustainable. 
Uh, and then, of course, strong relationships with local authorities and local recyclers. Uh, one we think is partic particularly critical, we've talked about local authorities because everything comes down to policy, but also local recyclers. Uh, we have such a great relationship with them. A lot of the, the times they actually do the training uh, for the informal sector workers to really show them what type of material they're looking for, what type of material they'll reject, and this also starts to build a stronger relationship between the informal sector workers and the, the direct buyer so that they can eventually take up those uh, relationships and then represent themselves. Um, so just in conclusion, uh, what we've learned is that cooperative models uh, have shown a lot of promise um, to increase wages and increase the collection of recyclable waste, that it is important to realize that not every informal sector waste worker is an entrepreneur. Um, it is critical that local authorities and other key stakeholders are involved in project development. Uh, I really can't stress that enough, uh, particularly because of the climate here. We really try to stay away from situations where we're making recommendations to government. And then, of course, we have uh, business models as well. Uh, I think someone's audio is on. Okay, but someone, then we have business models uh, that must be adapted based on area and workers chosen. Uh, one thing we can say is that none of our projects really look alike. Uh, they do all have the same core principles. We do sort of use some of the same core techniques, uh, but when it comes to the actual business model, sometimes we have to adapt this and it's really based on who are the workers available in that particular area? Uh, and what is the climate of that particular area? Um, so I'm just to learn more about our work, yeah, if you could go to our website. Yeah. Uh, you can also give us a call or you can email me directly. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, and um, yes, we're just now going to, uh, to say thank you to our presenters and could those who uh, are still on the, uh, the call, we are going to try and extend this call uh, for a short while, and I'd like to introduce Sally um, Tate Kasner, who is going to be just summarizing the questions and answers that we've had. Um, Sally, if you are there, um, we um, have been trying to answer the questions as we go, but Sally, can you give a sense of the questions that people were asking? Sure. So the hi everybody, and um, hopefully, yeah, we've we've been getting some comments through, and also some questions. And as Peter has said, I've tried to answer as many as I, I have been able to myself. Um, one of the ones was that you know, will the webinar be available to those who who have attended and who have not attended? And I have said that it will be, uh, you know, available to to all, um, whether you've attended or not. Um, and then quite a, a couple of questions that have come through around, so how do we do this? <laughs> Which is a very big question um, to all the panelists, especially it was directed to how does Africa to um, implement circular economy initiatives and how do we get our governments to respond um, seemingly while the global north uh, continues as on, on a business as usual type of trajectory. So I'm not sure if they are one of the panelists that would like to try and tackle that. Um, but essentially, just from my perspective, I think it's it's through webinars like this and having um, a project like being presented today um, through the UN um, and, and just saying, you know, where are we in Africa? Saying, you know, ASIN have put forward a, a couple of good projects in terms of, you know, we are doing this already. And the UN also saying that maybe we're not doing enough so I think as long as we keep talking about this and, and also doing action at the same time, um, I think we'll, we'll go a long way. But are there any panelists that would like to add to how do we transition from an African perspective? Well, I, can, I can try to, to add uh, to, to this point, to your point, uh, Sally. Uh, but basically, as you say, it's a, it's a big question. I mean, uh, when it comes to the global north, there are there are huge investment being made uh, as we speak in in these is in these uh, new models and new uh, 
project companies popping up uh, in the market. So obviously the challenge is huge and the Global North has to uh, change this pathway of business as usual. Mm -hmm. So yes, this is this is an ongoing uh, process, but things, they are great initiative from, from that side. In terms of Africa, uh, obviously Africa needs to develop its economies and uh, obviously uh, some somehow uh, linear economy will still be needed in Africa in order to grow uh, the stock of material. I mean, the e economies are still hungry for for growth, and uh, they need to to still uh, develop somehow uh, from an economic perspective. And they 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 would need to to still a bit of linear economy uh, for the next uh, years to come. But when it comes to to the circular economy, it's a matter of identifying uh, opportunities from from the waste but also from the reuse perspective and uh, setting up some hubs to uh, remanufacture and uh, repair and uh, and maintain the value of uh, especially electronic goods which are a huge uh, drama in terms of waste electronic waste um, it could be to from a country perspective to to discuss with the the Huawei and the Dell and the HPs of this world to ask them to come up with a, a an e-waste uh, plan so that we can uh, access uh, access uh, consumer goods and dismantle them and uh, and remake and re, re remake those those goods. Uh, th there are many initiatives in that sense. I mean, basically. In summary, uh, create some feedback loops. So create returnable goods uh, loops. Uh, you sell something to your customers, keep in touch with your customers so that either you take uh, the goods back from the customer or the stream of uh, waste, uh, bio waste back from the customers to create value or to repair the goods that you sold to the customers and replacing it uh, to them then. Thanks, Alex. Um, are there any other panelists that would like to contribute to that particular question, or shall we move on to, yeah. to another one? Oh, well, uh, this is Ellie. Uh, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Yeah. Cool. Um, look, I, I think that uh, I would agree with what uh, Alex had to say, but I just wanted to add a couple of things. Um, the first one is that I think it's important um, that uh, the informal sector in Africa uh, must have an organizing base. Um, in other words, the, uh, I don't think that uh, projects uh, can succeed without some independent form of, of uh, organizing and a voice, um, an organized voice uh, uh, within the, the informal sector. The second one is, is of course, um, um, the investment um, in technologies, but however, to make sure that those technologies are not uh, capital intensive, um, that they, they they must be labor intensive um, in their in their in their scope, and I think that the in South Africa, the one of the reasons why we have uh, such high rates of uh, of, of, uh, of collection um, in space. Someone is speaking. I'm not sure if my time is up. Just, just to finish the point, I was the, the, the last one, of course, is is with re, in relation to industry, um, the need to for for transparent implementation of, of uh, extended producer responsibility um, levies um, that uh, must be paid for by industry because at the end of the day, all of this needs to to be funded from somewhere, and I think that. Um, um, uh, ensuring that uh, manufacturers um, actually are able to, to 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 contribute towards the collection and the reuse of, of, of the material is, is, is a critical thing. And therefore, the payment of, of uh, part of those levies to those that, that do the actual collection, which is the informal set. Thank you. Thanks, Eli. Um, okay, so um, just to, I think maybe we could take one, one more, essentially is, um, uh, Muriel's presentation did uh, spark quite a few questions just around um, the charcoal itself uh, in terms of um, is would charcoal really be considered a circular type of approach um, so perhaps Muriel could provide some context there the question is their questions are in the in the questions box Muriel if you'd like to refer but some 
also looking at training materials related to the ecological charcoal from organic waste. Um, so, yeah, um, Muriel, are you still with us? Are you still able to provide some comment? <laughs> no, I'm still there. I, uh, it's weird, but I can't see the questions. Oh, uh, you should be able to see them under your questions box. I've put your name next to it, which means that you should be able to see them. Yes, but I don't know. I cannot can't see. Them. No. Oh, dear. Okay. But about the the question about. Oh, okay. I can. No, I cannot see. No. <laughs> <All right>. Okay. <laughs> so the question about um, if uh, charcoal is actually uh, can actually be a kind of circular um, product. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so yes, because. Um, this, this charcoal is actually made of organic waste, so basically it is um, the leftovers that that are not used anymore. So um, banana uh, peels, cassava peels, um, sugar cane, um, it, it's just the, the leftovers. It, it's not the, the actual kind of thing that you eat, so it's really the peel that are used, so it is um, actually um, the, the kind of waste um, which is then transformed, processed, to make uh, the green charcoal. So you don't um, cut any trees and it is in, in this perspective that it is a kind of circular because it's reusing the waste uh, that are already available and are littering, doing nothing, to um, produce a new source of energy that, will, that is actually a clean source of energy. So I don't know if I answered the question. Thanks, Muriel. Um, I think some of the some of the questions were around um, would it not be better then to either do anaerobic digestion or composting, and um, and then the other one was um, in terms of the actual burning of the coal itself. It's, is it really considered a cleaner type of energy? But but I suppose those are questions that that you've you've probably come across before. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 So I don't know if you want to just say a couple of words around around the, that as well. Okay, so it's, it, they're, they're very um, good and interesting questions. So the first one is, um, uh, is a composting a better alternative? I would say um, they are all um, possibilities. The fact that 80% uh, of the population is using wood and, and wood charcoal to, to cook today is a big issue. Mm -hmm. So we need to find uh, more sustainable um, uh, energy source. And, di and this is why the, the, the green charcoal is an answer to that, because it's using the waste to produce that kind of clean energy. And um, the second point is about um, the, the composting can still happen using other kind of, um, yes, using other kind of uh, organic waste. It doesn't actually, uh, it's not conflicting. I, I mean, um, there's not one solution to create mm. circular economy. There are many, and we don't have to choose this way or that way. We can do uh, everything as long as, as it makes sense and it responds to a, a specific problem. It doesn't uh, make sense to, for example, for some um, usages, for example, to have a lot of compost if you cannot use, use it. If you're not in uh, a kind of agricultural type of sector, if you are in the cities, probably it's better to produce charcoal, which will be used locally rather than uh, having compost and have a lot of difficulties to sell it to, um, to, 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 uh, to, to people practicing agriculture. And the second one was, um, is, it, um, is it really a, um, not polluting, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this, this charcoal is actually uh, not polluting um, there because uh, first of all uh, it's reusing so the, the waste so it um, it's really using the waste and it has been um, designed if you want to, uh, to 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 minimize all the the kind of fumes and smoke that can be emitted so the the, the entrepreneur um, with uh, who, who, who is running this startup is actually a, a researcher himself and he's been a lot of 
studies and analysis on the charcoal on how to make it really sustainable. He's been measuring the, 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 the gases uh, that the, the charcoal is producing. He's been, uh, he, he made the charcoal uh, very efficient from an um, energy point of view. So you using less charcoal uh, for um, like, like say a longer type of time of, um, of, uh, of usage. So if you want, um, they, I, 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 I will say that it's not polluting and because it has been designed not to pollute. Um, thanks, thanks, Muriel, for that. Um, Peter, there was just one last thing I just wanted to add, and I think you've responded to, to it in the questions. Uh, in the, in, um, 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 sorry, now I've just forgotten, um, is it Cecilia's presentation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there were some tools that she mentioned, and somebody was looking at how can the tools be developed, um, be used, are, are they open, are they open source? Um, so is that something that we can maybe follow up with um, and provide that kind of detail or feedback? I think yeah, that would be great. So, yes, because Cecilia has gone yeah. off the course. Yep, yeah, so, she's um, it, yeah. So that, uh, Perfect. I think what we'll try and do is is keep the questions and go through them and just uh, make sure that we've answered uh, everybody's points. And uh, uh, thank you for all your questions and comments. And we have yeah. overrun this webinar, and I do apologize, um, but some people have already dropped off. And I'd like to conclude to say thank you um, to the uh, speakers and to the organizers of the webinar at ECLE um, for making this possible and for all the attendees for, for coming along and um, uh, for your participation. And um, we look forward to engaging with you again in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks. Ciao.